Well, uh, first of all, thank you very much for having me here. It's a pleasure to present our work. This is a joint work with Damir Filipovic and uh, Yeye, my PhD student at Stanford University. And this paper is about a fundamental quantity in economics and finance, namely the discount or yield curve. So the discount curve gives you the price of a discount bond for any given maturity. Now, the problem is we do not observe the discount curve, but we have to estimate it from a sparse set of noisy treasury prices. Now, this paper is a methodology paper. So we develop a data-driven non-parametric discount curve estimator. And it's combining financial theory with modern machine learning. So we can provide a closed form solution for our estimator as a simple linear rich regression. And we can also provide confidence intervals. So overall, we can provide a simple, fast, transparent, and robust estimator that is very precise for estimating yields. Now, we have an extensive empirical um, uh, study in our paper where we show that our yield curve estimator strongly dominates all parametric and non-parametric benchmark estimators. So it will substantially it will provide substantially smaller out-of-sample yield or pricing errors. It is robust to outliers and to any data selection choices. So overall, we view our estimation method as a new standard for yield curve estimation. There is no better way to estimate a yield or discount curve, and we provide publicly available data that researchers and practitioners can use. Let me start with the problem now. So what we want to estimate is the unobserved discount curve, which we denote by G. So X is a maturity. Uh, this can be any maturity, let's say, between um, one day and 30 years. And G is the price of a non-defaultable zero coupon bond with that maturity X. Now, we do not observe G. But what we do observe is a set of uh, coupon bonds. So typically, on an average day, we have 300 treasury securities, which are coupon bonds. So these coupons are paid, for example, every six months. That is what we call our cash flow dates. And so a cash flow matrix tells us what the coupon payments are for these cash flow dates. So the, what we observe are these, roughly speaking, 300 coupon bond prices and the corresponding cash flows with their dates. Now, the law of one price says that a coupon bond should be, could be expressed as a portfolio of discount bonds. That means the price of a coupon bond should be the price of the discount bonds, which are given by the discount curve, evaluated as the cash flow dates, multiplied by the cash flow payments at those dates. Now, this relationship will not hold exactly in practice because there will be pricing errors due to market imperfections or data errors. But this is a fundamental building block for estimating the discount curve. Now, if you want to estimate the discount curve, a very straightforward idea would be to minimize weighted pricing errors. So we can choose some exogenous weight and try to find a discount curve that minimizes the pricing errors um, based on the law of one price. Now, the issue is that we observe only around 300 treasuries. But if we want to get the discount curve for 30 years for each day, we need to estimate 10,000 data points. Right? I mean, so any estimation approach needs to impose some kind of assumption, some regularization structure on the problem to restrict the number of parameters. Now, what most uh, estimation approaches do, they assume some form of ad hoc assumptions. For example, they impose some kind of parametric form, or they make relatively ad hoc assumptions on non-parametric estimation to deal with the dimensionality issue of this problem. Now, we pursue a different way. We just use the fundamental properties of this problem and show how to use them to get a solution. So more specifically, we argue that the fundamental property of the discount curve is smoothness. So economic principles imply that a discount curve should be smooth. In fact, if we observe um, jumps in a discount curve, you know, from there's a discount bond that matures at time t and another bond that matures at time t plus one, the price is very different, we can construct a risk-free strategy with an extreme payoff. And limits to arbitrage imply that we need a certain degree of smoothness to avoid these type of situations. Now, how do we define smoothness? Now, if we have a general function, we can measure smoothness in terms of its first and second derivative. So this is a very general smoothness measure here. 
So the second derivative can be interpreted as a curvature of a curve. So if you penalize curvature, we're trying to avoid kinks in a curve. The first square derivative can be interpreted as a tension. So penalizing the first derivative means we are straightening out our curve. We are trying to get curves that have le less oscillation. Now, there is a weight between these two. We call it the tension parameter uh, delta. It tells us how much weight we put on the first or the second derivative. And we can put different weights on the maturities. This will be governed by a parameter that we call alpha. It's a maturity weight. And as we will show in the paper, um, it corresponds to an infinite maturity yield, actually. So it has an economic interpretation. Now, we will study the extremely large space of discount curves that are twice differentiable and have a finite smoothness measure. So it means um, uh, when we plug them into this norm here, it will be finite. This is extremely general. And now we can come back to our problem. So the fundamental optimization problem that we want to solve is we want to find a curve in this really large space that minimizes the pricing error subject to a certain degree of smoothness. Now the smoothness is controlled by a smoothness penalty here or smoothness reward lambda. So if we increase lambda, we will get a smoother curve. Now here you can see um, that we also have some exogenous weights. So short maturity bonds can have a different weight compared to long maturity bonds. Here we will use a standard in the literature, which is we argue also the right object to use here, which are inverse duration weights, which means we're essentially minimizing yield errors. Now, what is important, this problem is completely determined up to three parameters. The three parameters are how much smoothness reward do we have? That means what is lambda? And how do we measure smoothness? That means what is the tension parameter, this trade-off between tens tension and curvature? And how much weight do we put on short versus long maturity bonds in the tension, in the curvature measure? Now, why does it make sense to have this smoothness penalty here? Well, increasing the smoothness has three effects. First, and that's the obvious effect, it will reduce excessive oscillation and will give us a less curved or less kinked uh, function. Second, um, if we have a smoother curve, intuitively it can be described by fewer parameters. And we make this argument for, uh, we provide a more formal argument in the paper. That means this kind of smoothness uh, reward is also a regularization of the problem. And last but not least, having smoothness provides robustness against outliers. Because as you might imagine, if we have one data point that jumps up in the curve, requiring the curve to be smooth means that we will not overfit this one outlier data point. All right, now we can provide a solution to this optimization problem. And what I want to emphasize here is that we use a different perspective from the rest of the literature. So the usual approach in parametric or non-parametric estimation is to specify an ad hoc set of basis functions, and then to study the properties of the solution when you use this basis function optimization problem. We reverse the order. We say we start with a fundamental problem. We want to find any curve that is just twice differentiable that minimizes our optimization problem. That means minimizes pricing errors subject to some degree of smoothness. Setting up the problem implies an optimal choice of basis functions for our non-parametric estimation. And the tool that we are going to use will be reproducing kernel Hilbert spaces. Those build on insights in functional analysis and are a fundamental tool in machine learning. So what we take advantage of is a celebrated representer theorem. Our problem is quite complicated. We want to estimate an infinite dimensional object, namely a whole function but the celebrated representer theorem allows us to map this into a finite dimensional problem. So to be more specific, um, by setting up the objective function, that means we want to have minimized pricing errors and have a certain degree of smoothness and defining the space of functions, which is essentially twice differentiable, the representer theorem uniquely pins down the basis functions that we need to solve this non-parametric problem. So the solution will be linear in these basis functions and can be formulated as a simple linear regression. That's what I want to do on the next slide here. So remember the fundamental problem was to minimize pricing errors subject to a smoothness uh, reward. Now this fundamental problem has this unique solution given in the following form. So the basis functions are given by a kernel K 
And that is completely determined by the smoothness measure. So there's no choice that we have to make. And the solution is linear in these basis functions, where the coefficients, the betas, are given by a simple rich regression. That is why we call our estimator kernel rich solution, or in short, just KR for the rest of the talk. Now, in this kernel rich regression, the rich penalty corresponds to our smoothness reward. Now, what is also interesting and useful to observe is that these discount, so the solution is linear in the observed prices, which implies that discount bonds are portfolios of the coupon bonds. That is relevant, for example, because it implies simple, directly implementable immunization strategies for any complex payoff. Now, in the paper, we show that essentially all the relevant and uh, popular estimators like Pharma Bliss, Nelson Siegel Swenson, Smith Wilson, kernel estimators of discount curves are special cases of our more general framework. They're special cases in the sense that the function that they can approximate are in the space of function that we can approximate. So um, they correspond to very specific parameter choices of our model. And if we perform better out of sample, it just means that these other estimators make non-optimal choices. Now, we can also provide a distribution theory. I mean, as most of you know, if you have a regularized estimator, you can also use a, use a Bayesian perspective, perspective to describe it. So if you are willing to assume that the discount curve has a Gaussian prior distribution and that the pricing errors follow a certain Gaussian distribution as well, then we can show that our estimator, this KR estimator, corresponds to the posterior mean of this Gaussian process, right? So we get the same estimator if you use a Bayesian approach. This is useful because uh, we can also show that the posterior distribution will be a Gaussian process with a non-posterior variance. And simply speaking, this means we can provide confidence intervals for the discount curve or any security that we price with our discount curve. Let me come now to the empirics. So we will have a very extensive out of sample analysis on US treasury securities. These are based on the CRISP treasury data file. Um, we have daily data from 61 to 2020. So most of the results I'm going to show today will be based on the end of month's price. All I want to say here is that we use very standard data. It's a type of data that you see in the related literature for a discount curve estimation. Now, everything today that I show will be out of sample results. The paper also has the in sample results. Um, so when I talk about out of samples, there will be two ways to do it. One is we estimate on day T, our discount curve, and we use it to price coupon bonds on day T plus one. So this will be an out of sample evaluation on the next day. An alternative is a cross-sectional out of sample evaluation where I take on day T all coupon bonds and I create stratified samples. So in our case, it will be samples, we create 10 folds. Each fold is sampled such that it has the same maturity distribution as the overall sample. And then we use nine folds to estimate a discount curve and we price the 10th fold and we repeat it for all 10 combinations. I will report root mean squared errors, RMSE, for the yields and the percentage pricing errors. The benchmark models that we use are the most relevant models in the literature. In terms of parametric models, we use the Nelson Siegel Swenson model. Uh, and in short, it will be NSS. Gunyana, Sag, and Wright implement the Nelson Siegel curve um, on a re more restricted data set of um, treasury securities. Their estimates are publicly available, and we will also use them as a benchmark. In terms of non parametric models, we use the Pharma Bliss estimators, short FB. This assumes a piecewise constant forward curve. And we also include the Liu and Wu uh, estimator from a recently published paper. That is a kernel smoothing method that uses pre-specified normal kernels with a very specific adaptive band bandwidth selection. Now there are more estimators out there, for example, splines, but uh, related papers have shown that the kernel smoothing method will be better than local splines. And given that we will be better than all of these estimators by the transversality principle, um, we will also be better than splines, for example. Now, before I show the results, I just want to explain how the data looks like. And here I'm showing you over time the maximum time to maturity for all the bonds that we have. So the red line is the largest maturity available on each day. 
So what you should see here is that, first of all, we have a very unequal maturity distribution. There are more short maturity bonds than long maturity bonds. That matters when you do cross-sectional out-of-sample analysis. You need to use stratified sampling in that case. We also have an unbalanced panel. For example, 30 years are only available for the second part of the sample. And you can also observe that there's a middle region, like from 10 to 20 years of maturity, where we have very few observations. This will not be a problem for our estimator, but we show that it uh, poses a challenge to other estimators. Now, first, we need to pick the tuning parameters. So remember, we have three parameters, lambda, alpha, and delta that we need to pick. So we are going to use cross out of sample validation. We use a stratified sampling with the 10 folds. Um, and here I'm showing you the out of sample yield errors as a function of lambda, that's the smoothness penalty, and the maturity weight alpha. Here I've set the tension to zero, and I will argue later that that is the optimal weight. So what you can observe here is if you pick lambda close to zero, you get very large out of sample errors. So you need regularization. If you pick too much regularization, that would be the extreme lambda, you get a curve that's not flexible enough. But we show that the lambda around one is optimal, so it gives the smallest yield errors. And we also show that the choice is very robust. So if you increase or decrease the lambda by some degrees, it's not changing it. We don't need to pin down lambda exactly. We just need to get the right range. The alpha doesn't matter that much. So we will pick alpha 0.5 as our baseline parameter. Uh, and we will show that the choice of alpha is mainly an effect on very long maturity bonds. But for short or the medium spectrum, it's not very relevant. And also the results are extremely robust to the choice of alpha. Now, having selected alpha 0.5, 0.05, I want to look at this tension parameter. Remember, that's a trade-off between the first and the second derivative. So if we choose lambda, the smoothness penalty as one, and then we only uh, change how much weight we put on the first or second derivative, we see that putting weight on the second derivative is more important. So we can essentially put a zero weight on the first derivative and we get a close to optimal solution. That makes sense if you think about it because the second derivative of the discount curve is closely related to the first derivative of the yield curve. And that's really the object that we want to penalize. So the takeaway, the optimal model that we are going to use from now on will have um, a choice of lambda equal to one, alpha 5% and delta equal to zero. And again, the results are extremely robust to this choice of tuning parameters. Now, what happens if we uh, vary these tuning parameters? Just want to show this on the representative example day where I plot estimated yield curves for different choices of these parameters. So on the left, I show you what happens if we change lambda. So lambda one, that's the red line, is our uh, baseline model. If you choose lambda close to zero, you get a really wiggly curve that is this black line because as expected, it will overfit the data. If you choose lambda extremely large, you will get a curve that's not flexible enough. On the other hand, if you look at the effect of alpha after we have selected lambda optimally, you can see that alpha doesn't have any effect really for the shorter maturities. It only has an effect for the very long maturities. And we show in the paper that alpha can be interpreted as infinite maturity yield. So in some way, it is just the end point if you would increase the maturity to infinity and we are connecting our estimated curve with this end point. Now this here is very important, so please pay attention. Here I'm showing you the out of sample pricing errors for all the different benchmark methods. So KR is a black method, that's our method. Nelson Siegel, GSW are the parametric methods. Liu W and Pharma Bliss are these non-parametric baseline benchmark methods. So here I show you out of sample evaluation on the next business day. And I show you the evaluation for different maturity buckets. So for all bonds that mature, um, before three months, between three months and one year, between one year and two years, etc. Now, what you can see here, the black line, that's our method, it's uniformly better than any other method. If you use a parametric method like GSW or Nelson Siegel, you get very large yield errors. And in particular, the short end, short maturity bonds have very large errors. And that's well known in the literature. If you use a Pharma Bliss method, 
the long maturity bonds have really large yield errors, larger than for any other method. So it's not very well suited for long maturity bonds. The Liu and Wu kernel method provides the second best method. So it's close to ours, but for regions where there are very few prices observed. So remember for the maturities between 10, 20 and 30 years is relatively sparse. That is where this method will not be very good because it's a purely local estimation method. If there are few data points or if these data points have outliers, it will not perform well. Now these are yield errors. If you look at uh, percentage pricing errors, we get exactly the same result. If I look at duration weighted pricing errors, it's essentially a yield error, again, same results. Now let's have a look at aggregated pricing metrics. So instead of looking at these different maturity buckets, I show you the results uh, averaged over all maturities. And here, um, the third set of bar plots shows the yield um, errors uh, in basis points. And here I show the results for the full data set. So I haven't removed any type of outliers. So our method has the smallest yield error. Um, now, the Fama Bliss method looks pretty good here. And one reason is we have a lot of bonds that have a very short maturity. And Fama Bliss is not that bad for short maturities. So these averages are oversampling the short maturities. If I use maturity weighted yield errors, essentially I'm weighting bonds such uh, that each maturity has approximately an equal weight. Then you see that the Fama Bliss method has much larger errors. In any case, it doesn't matter what metric we use, our method always has the smallest errors. Now, this is also robust how we deal with outliers. If we remove the first three months maturity bonds as this three months filter, we get the same ordering, but we see that our method will perform even better relative to Pharma Bliss because Pharma Bliss mainly fits well the very short end. We have other outlier filters using other methods to identify outliers or our, our own method to identify outliers. We always get the same ordering. It doesn't matter what metric we use, our method is the best. So our method is more robust and more precise than any other estimator. So why is that? Let me show you a representative example day here and where we fitted a yield curve with the non-parametric and the parametric methods. So on the left, you see our method KR and the kernel method of uh, Liu and Wu and Fama Bliss. So what you can see here is that our method and Liu and Wu seem to be very close. If you use Fama Bliss, you get an extremely non-smooth curve because it's piecewise linear, you get these uh, kinks in it and it's going to overfit uh, individual um, uh, outlier bonds. So it's not a reliable method to get a discount curve. On the other hand, if you look at parametric methods, they are misspecified. In particular, the short end, you can see it has a misspecified form, which creates this huge pricing errors for the short end. Now, what is the smoothness of these different uh, um, uh, estimators? So we argued that an optimal estimator should trade off um, small pricing errors and smoothness. So what I'm showing you here is a discretized smoothness as measured by uh, the, um, um, the second derivative. And on the left, so I'm showing this for different maturity buckets. On the left, you can see that the red line, that is Fama Bliss, is extremely non-smooth. I mean, that's what we have seen on the previous plot. It has its kinks and it's wiggly everywhere. So it's a very non-smooth method and that contributes towards this bad out of sample uh, pricing errors. Now, if you remove Fama Bliss here so that we can zoom in more, then we see there's this second least smooth method is Liu and Wu. Now, the reason why that is the case is they have a very specific way how they select these bandwidths and that will create jumps in the estimated discount curve. So their curve is not smooth. If you look at a parametric model like Nelson Siegel, this will also have more curvature than our model because it's a very short end. Remember the last plot? You get sometimes these very wiggly shapes. So it's actually also not that smooth. So what we observe is that our method gets the smallest pricing errors and the smoothest curve because it optimally trades off smoothness and pricing errors. Now, coming back to what you've seen before, the Liu and Wu method looked relatively comparable but we just want to clarify their important differences. So the Liu and Wu method intuitively worked as follows. 
it takes the yields of observed bonds of the eight nearby observed bonds and takes the weighted average of those yields to get an estimate for a specific point. This means if one of the eight nearby bonds is an outlier, it should completely distort the estimation. And that's what we observe. So here I have a representative example day that will contaminate exactly one bond and that is indicated by the red line. I contaminate one bond price by increasing it artificially by three, five, or 10%. And then I estimate our KR method and the Liu and Wu method. What you can see is that the discount curves that we estimate with our method are not really affected by putting in an extreme outlier. The reason is we have this regularization that is a global regularization. If you look at the Liu and Wu method, which is just a local average of data points, you put in one outlier, it will be completely distorted in the region where the outlier is. So overall, we conclude that our estimator is not only the most flexible and the most precise, it's also the most robust to outliers. Now, what about extrapolation? So here's a conceptual point. Um, here's a, I will illustrate with an example day. For this example day, the maximum maturity is 30 years. So estimating a discount curve is essentially an interpolation problem. So you observe some points and you interpolate the curve in between the points. Extrapolation is a different problem. So here we look at what our curves would look like if we would go up to 50 years of maturity, although we only observe 30 years maximum. Now we can estimate in sample the optimal curvature, smoothness parameter lambda. So we can conclude from in sample data that lambda should be one. However, everything else on the out of sample data is essentially a choice. So the choice of alpha, that was this, um, uh, which corresponds to an infinite maturity yield cannot be determined reliably in sample. So if I choose an alpha that is small, I'm essentially collecting my interpolated curve with a small value. If I choose a large alpha, I connect it with a large value. So what I really want to say here is that extrapolation depends on tuning parameter choices that cannot be estimated in sample. So extrapolation is always a choice and you cannot verify it on observed data. You can just impose an economic prior or an assumption. And then given that prior assumption, you can do extrapolation. So it's not a weakness of our, of our approach. It's just a more conceptual point. So what about um, uncertainty uh, quantification? So given the Gaussian perspective, we can provide um, confidence intervals. What I show you here is a 99% confidence interval for the estimated yield curve on an example day. And what you can see here, it's really tight, what we estimate. Um, it becomes wider for very short maturities. And that makes sense because we have a larger price dispersion in that region. If we would use for that day our curve for extrapolation, so up to 50 years, these confidence bands would explode because that's exactly the point I made before. Uh, extrapolation becomes a choice. It's not an estimation problem anymore. Here, I give you a second example day. And this example day is interesting because um, in the region between 20 to 30 years, we have very few bonds observed. And that's exactly where the confidence band will get wider. So the results that we get with our distribution theory make sense intuitively and can be useful. Now, last but not least, does all of this matter, right? I mean, now I've tried to show you that we get better estimates of the yield curve, but how does it matter economically? So what I want to show you here is a time series of the one month yield estimates with different methods. I mean, this quantity is crucial, right? Any reduced from asset pricing model to create excess returns will use this quantity. So the blue line is the GSW. The Nelson Siegel model is essentially the same. You can't really see it here because it's um, overlapping with the blue line. The point I want to make here is that if you use a parametric model like Nelson Siegel or GSW, you cannot in good faith work with those one month yield estimates. They're extremely noisy. They're completely misspecified. It would get wrong economic results in any kind of application that you would use. Now, what about longer maturity bonds? So here I look at the 10 year forward rate. So it's a um, forward rate from year 10 to year 11. And I show you here the different estimators. And what you can see is that Pharma Bliss is unreliable for long maturities, right? So you can see that it deviates from all the other um, four estimates that we have here substantially. So if you would use, um, use this estimate in a macroeconomic application, 
this would be highly misspecified and it can distort follow up results. All right. So, what about KR, our method versus Liu and Wu? So, those are much closer. And what I'm showing you here is the 10 year forward rate estimates. And you see there will be some differences. So, there are points where these two estimates deviate. And in the paper, we dig deeper and show that these deviations are obviously instabilities of the Liu and Wu estimator. So, it's not an error from our side, but we can make, clearly make an argument that these are data points where our estimator gives the right value and Liu and Wu gives the wrong value. And that is because Liu and Wu is not very stable and prone to outliers. So it means if you have an application for which you need really precise estimates, um, then it will matter if you use our estimate or another uh, non-parametric estimator. So last but not least, um, we have this non-parametric estimator where the basis functions are given by the problem. So we do not choose them, but they come out of the problem formulation. So what is the structure of the basis functions? So what I'm showing you here are the eigenvectors of the largest eigenvalue of the kernel matrix. You can think of these as the basis functions that we use to construct our um, discount bonds. They correspond roughly to portfolio weights for um, our discount bond estimator. Now, what you can see here is that the shapes of our basis functions look very familiar. It looks like a level slope curvature type pattern. You know, this is like a slope pattern. This is like a curvature, like a second degree polynomial, third degree polynomial, fourth degree polynomial, fifth degree polynomial, etc. So there's a very specific structure that we find in these shapes. And that is not a coincidence. So what I'm showing you here is I estimate with these different estimators, uh, panels of discount bonds, and then I apply uh, a PCA to the discount bond prices. You will see essentially the same type of polynomial shapes. And you'll see that the, for the first two to three PCAs, all estimators try to capture quite similar shape. But then if you look at shape, uh, the shape of the fourth, fifth, or sixth PCA, there will be deviations. So in particular, if you look at the fourth and fifth PCA, the Pharma Bliss and the GSW or Nelson Siegel will be very misspecified. They will create shapes that are very different from the more precise estimators. Now, this has important implications when it comes to asset pricing and constructing asset pricing, term structure asset pricing factors. So we have a companion paper where we show very clearly that there's a connection between these shapes and asset pricing factors and basis functions to span the discount curve. So estimating uh, asset pricing factor for the term structure is a joint problem of having a non-parametric estimation of the discount curve in describing the discount curve with a small number of factors. And that is where it really matters that you get this higher order PCs very precise. So the reason why, for example, the literature didn't find that fourth or fifth PCA with GSW is important for asset pricing is because GSW gives you, through, gives you the wrong panel of discount bond prices. So you will not get the right structure out of those. So in other words, the methods differ in the higher order PCs and any application that relies on very precise estimation of these higher order PCs will be affected by the choice of method. So let me wrap up here. So that's about the economic importance of getting precise yield curve um, estimations. So if you compare non-parametric versus parametric estimators, that means essentially our estimates or Liu and Wu versus GSW or Nelson Siegel. Um, there's already a literature, so that's not all our finding that has shown if you use GSW estimates, it has impact on the predictability, on forecasting regressions, on excess volatility, and it, you will get wrong statements if you use that type of data. Now, we also show if you use uh, the very short rate for GSW, it will not be suitable for asset pricing. It's completely distorted. Now, the implication of using KR, our method, versus other non parametric methods like uh, Liu and uh, Wu is a little bit more pronounced, it's a little more subtle. So, there are economic implications when we need extremely precise estimation of the yield curve. So I've shown you before, they're different than the fifth and sixth principal component. We have a companion paper, it should get out in the next couple of days, at the latest weeks, where we show that estimating term structure risk premium and term structure risk factors is a joint problem of the non-parametric yield curve estimation and 
allow rank um, decomposition of this yield curve. Uh, and we show that higher order PCs factors are important. So once you have a very precise estimation of the yield curve, you need the higher order PCs. They have a substantial risk premium and a very precise estimation of yields results in exploitable out of sample trading strategies. We also think that the implications are more important when, this, when a user wants to estimate the yield curve for other countries. So US treasuries is a relatively rich data set. If you look at other bond data, you have fewer observations. They're often also noisier. Then it becomes more important to have a robust estimator that works with very few data points. And that would be ours. So let me wrap up here now. So our paper is a methodological paper. We introduce a simple, fast, transparent, robust, and extremely precise estimator for yields. It is a non-parametric non estimator that is based on the optimal trade-off between flexibility and smoothness. We learn the optimal basis functions in the reproducing Colonel Hilbert space, given our smoothness reward. It's extremely simple to implement. It's just a simple uh, uh, rich regression, which we can provide in closed form. And given a Gaussian perspective, we can also provide confidence intervals. We have a very extensive empirical study. We show that out of sample and also in sample, our estimator strongly dominates all parametric and non-parametric estimators. It provides substantially smaller out of sample yield and pricing errors. It is robust to outliers and data selection choices. And we view it as a new method of choice for use in insurance, banking, regulators, central banks, or any researcher. And we provide publicly available data sets that we're going to um, update regularly. Um, and we hope that you are going to use our method and our data. And now I look forward to the discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you, Marcus. Thank you for your presentation. We, we have the... We have the discussion, uh, Dr. Li Yuan Chui. So hello everyone, uh, I'm Lian from the City University of Hong Kong. Uh, it's my great pleasure to discuss the paper by Professor Filipovic, uh, Professor Powder and Ye. Uh, at the outset, I do like this paper. Uh, it is novel in its methodology and wide in its applications. Um, here's my presentation uh, discussion. Um, the roadmap here, it contains two parts. So the first part briefly summarizes the paper's main messages. And the second part uh, shall elaborate the contributions of this paper. So particularly my discussion amends two additional literature uh, that I personally find might be relevant and help sharpen the contributions of this paper. Um, so this paper proposes a novel methodology to estimate the discount curve, which represents the fundamental values of a zero bond trader, a zero coupon trader rebound. It is a function of the time to maturity um, by the law of one price, um, the secure the value, the price of zero coupon bond uh, could be represented as a portfolio of zero coupon bonds, where the ways are the cash flows. Uh, to determine uh, the cur uh, discount curve, uh, it is equivalent to minute to find a function that minimizes the weighted mean square arrows between the observed the bond prices and the fundamental values. So here are the three main challenges in the literature. So firstly, the discount curve is generally not observable. So therefore, econometricians often need to parametrically or non-parametrically approximate this unknown function. 
And secondly, uh, the second part relates to the curse of dimensionality uh, because the number of the observable bond prices is often way smaller than the number of the uh, time to maturity. That means the number of parameters to be estimated is smaller than the cross-sectional dimension. Uh, this is the um, uh, long-standing curse of dimensionality problem. And third, the estimated uh, discount curve is expected to be small, uh, sufficiently smooth, uh, which could exclude large sudden changes. Uh, the reason is we want to avoid extreme payoffs from uh, risk-free trading strategies. So for those three long-standing uh, difficulties, uh, the paper by uh, Professor Filipovic uh, Pelger and Ye proposed the following resolution. Uh, they proposed a regularized uh, least square solution where they strike a balance. Uh, they search the, uh, the estimate the unknown uh, discount curve by striking a balance between the goodness of feet and the smoothness measure. And it contributes to the literature by the way it measures the smoothness level of the unknown function, uh, as has been explained in the, uh, in the presentation. Um, so they consider three sources um, of uh, factors could affect the smoothness, uh, including the oscillation levels, uh, the kinks and the time to maturity. Uh, they try to avoid excess oscillations and kinks so that the estimated discount curve could be sufficiently smooth and also achieve a satisfactory pricing errors. Um, this is the main formulation of the problem. To solve this problem, uh, the authors, uh, I think it's a brilliant idea to uh, introduce the a Hilbert space with reprodu uh, reproducing kernels, because with the use of the Hilbert uh, reproducing kernel Hilbert space, uh, this paper uh, enjoys a pitting closed form and one step solution, which has uh, a very nice uh, one step uh, closed form solution in the uh, uh, kernel and rich outlook. So, this is the main structure uh, and the uh, theoretical a methodological contribution of the paper. So let me talk about uh, its contributions or merits. So firstly, this, uh, the solution of this paper can cater a wide range of empirically relevant setup. So to look at this, if we consider uh, this is the most general case, uh, which uh, controls the smoothness level of the unknown function by considering, uh, by penalizing kinks, by penalizing uh, curvatures and the time to maturity. But there are two more interesting and important special cases catered in this paper. Uh, the first uh, interesting special case is here. Uh, that means the yield curve is penalized by the curvature only uh, with respect to time. And another very interesting application, uh, a special case uh, is to uh, find <laughs> the, the, the smooth uh, while avoiding oscillation levels. And so the paper has the smoothness, uh, smoothness matter tailored to different scenarios. And the second contribution is the novelty in theoretical part. So as we can see, the use of the reproducing kernel Hilbert space uh, uh, enjoy, uh, makes this paper enjoys the uh, kernel rich solution. So which is a closed form and uh, has a very nice global solution. And secondly, compared to existing parametric methods, it might negate possible misspecification errors. And also something important is the uh, choice of the kernel function. Uh, unlike uh, existing non-parametric methods, uh, the kernel functions are data-driven instead of uh, ad hoc pre-selection. And lastly, this paper provides very nice uh, large sample properties, uh, which will also help uh, contribute to another literature I shall talk about later. So regarding the empirical contribution, uh, just to name a few, 
um, this paper, uh, the method proposed uh, produces the least the root mean square error for the uh, equity prices compared to other methods, both in sample and out of sample. And this method is robust to outliers and various fielder methods. And the paper provides uh, detailed insights about uh, the principal component analysis and comparisons uh, for the factor structure with different estimators. Uh, so this is a quick summary of the paper, then let's switch gear uh, to something technical and try to understand why such a new method enjoys such a number of appealing features. So I would like to, uh, if we think about the um, traditional or conventional non-parametric estimation literature, where we often use local and global smoothing estimators to estimate unknown functions, particularly uh, to estimate smooth unknown functions. So why these two main vehicles widely used in the econometric literature fail? Uh, so I think such a competing table, uh, I prepare such a competing table, a competing table to better understand this point. Uh, as explained by Professor Powder, the new kernel ridge estimator proposed in this paper has a global solution. It utilizes all sample sizes. Um, so however, compared to conventional kernel estimators, such as the local constant Natalia Watson or local linear estimators, they are literally using only a small window around each realization point for estimation. So there are two consequences. The first the consequence is the complexity of the numerical computation. The second problem is the choice of the bandwidth because they need to determine the optimal window for each local point uh, to perform estimation. So usually kernel estimations are very sensitive to the choice of bandwidth, but this is not an issue for this new estimator proposed in this paper. And something else is about the boundary issue. Uh, so uh, as we know, kernel estimators often encounter estimation inconsistency for ending points in the two uh, region, uh, boundary regions. So the literature often need to perform either trimming the boundary data or performing data reflection for estimation consistency. Uh, however, we will see a difference in the convergence rate for conventional kernel estimators in the local, uh, in the middle and the boundary areas, but also this is not a point, not an issue uh, in the kernel ridge estimator proposed in this paper. I think this could be another reason why the kernel ridge estimator outperforms the conventional local estimator, such as Liu and Wu's 2021's work. So uh, therefore a minor suggestion, the paper could consider comparing the estimation consistency, uh, estimation accuracy level uh, in the boundary regions, um, which I think will also outperform the kernel estimators. So um, next I shall look at, I shall prepare a new, another competing table, uh, competing table to explain um, why the new kernel ridge estimator also outperform conventional global estimator. So conventional global estimator also uses the entire sample size. Uh, and they perform estimation only once. It's a global procedure, but, comp uh, but the conventional global estimators such as series estimators or CIF, uh, if we consider infinite dimensional estimation, they involve the choice of basis functions. This is highlighted in the paper, depending on whether we have bounded support, depending on the periodicity uh, features of the unknown function, we need to choose basis functions properly. Given the, uh, given the basis function, we also need to choose the order of the series expansions for conventional global smoothing uh, because the uh, uh, order which is chosen too small gonna render approximation biases, but the order that is too large gonna offer overfitting, uh, but the, also the order of the series expansion in conventional global smoothing affects the rate of convergence. But this is not an issue here because it does not re require choosing basis functions, determining its uh, order of series expansions. I think this is another striking feature compared to the conventional global smoothing estimator. And something uh, I think is also relevant is the yield postness for the conventional global estimators uh, because um, for conventional global estimators, uh, it is a fractal equation of the first kind. That means there's possibly no continuity between the losses function and the distance between the true parameter and the estimator. So uh, 
However, for the kernel region estimator, it has a very nice Tikhonov related regularization, uh, which on the other hand, uh, naturally avoids the yield postness problem. So a minor suggestion is the author could consider amending some discussions on the ability to avoid potential yield postness from conventional global smoothing methods. So next, I would like to talk about two additional literature I personally find relevant to this paper and helps sharpen the contribution. So the, if we look at a special case that is included uh, by the kernel ridge estimator in this paper, that is let delta equal to one. Uh, for simplicity, we can let alpha equal to zero. And the original uh, regularization problem boils down to the following procedure. Uh, that means we uh, strike a balance between the goodness of feed and, the, uh, and also avoid excess oscillations for the unknown function. Uh, such a uh, framework, is also known as the weak differentiability condition in the non-stationary time series literature. So in this non-stationary time series literature, econometricians looks for assigning uh, the time varying affiliation weights on some stationary models to approximate non-stationary observations. And they're also using this uh, framework uh, to estimate a known function G, which is a function of time. So even though they have the same framework in this special case, they solve this problem in a completely different way. Uh, they often use the finite element approach, the so-called FEM uh, machine learning literature. Uh, it's literally something like a global smoothing estimator. And they're gonna determine the best basis function basis functions. Um, so we see the, uh, I think there's a natural link between this uh, quite different literature and this paper. So um, here is the, I think the contributions this paper could um, offer to this non-stationary literature, because to the best of my knowledge, uh, the existing FEM non-stationary literature focuses on the establishment of model solvency and numerical solutions. However, as we can see, this FEM machine le learning literature can be considered as a special case to this kernel ridge estimator. Moreover, this paper generalizes uh, sample size t from a finite number to infinity. And moreover, uh, because the FEM method could be considered as a global smoothing estimators, so therefore the advantages uh, the KR method over global smoothing estimators also apply here. And something interesting is that uh, to determine the optimal model to approximate non-stationary time series observations, uh, they rely on co the construction of confidence intervals. That means rely on the ana uh, limit, central limit theorem analysis. But this, to the best of my knowledge, uh, this paper, uh, uh, so the FEM literature does, um, does not have um, a well-investigated um, central limit theorem so far. So the large sample properties established uh, this is my personal feeling. So the very last point is I wish to also talk about this literature, uh, the so-called penalized regression spline literature. Uh, the reason is if we look at a special case by letting delta equal to zero and alpha equal to zero, uh, we have this uh, uh, special case of the paper where we uh, penalize uh, unknown functions, kinks or curvatures. So such a framework is the special case of this paper, but also relates to the very famous penalized regressions work, uh, for example, see Rupert uh, from Cornell. Um, for such a literature, they propose solving this uh, penalized regression problem by using uh, uh, by constructing the unknown function using splines. And they're gonna penalize uh, the, the curvature level uh, using this procedure. Um, so if we could summarize this uh, penalized B-spline literature, we can see it could be considered as a special case of the KR estimator proposed in this paper. And moreover, because the uh, B-spline is also a special case uh, of global smoothing, uh, so the spline functions are pre-chosen. Uh, so, and also it involves the choice of the uh, series expansions and the number of nulls involved in uh, implementing series uh, penalized B-splines. Uh, 
yeah, but generally those will all affect the estimation results. But this paper outperforms global smoothing in a number of ways we have mentioned before. Uh, so my suggestion could be uh, this paper could consider comparing the results with this related to the penalized uh, spline literature, um, which, which also falls into the uh, global smoothing literature. Um, yeah, I think this paper, uh, I think it's a brilliant idea to um, introduce the reproducing kernel Hilbert space uh, in estimating unknown functions. And because it is robust, flexible, and easy to implement, and this paper outperforms state-of-art the existing non-parametric estimators, Need, it is needless to say the parametric ones. And uh, it includes many existing studies and special cases. Moreover, uh, it will complement uh, the FEM non-stationary time series literature, um, which lacks, generally lacks a theoretical guarantee. It also uh, includes the penalized the spline regression literature as a special case. Uh, so um, yeah, in general, I do like this paper and highly recommend a reading uh, and deep learning. All right, thank you. Thank you, Liyuan, for the discussion. Uh, Marcus, do you want to respond to her comments in, in one or two minutes? Yes. Uh, first, thank you so much for this great and insightful discussion. Second, uh, I also want to apologize for appearing late. Uh, I. I mean, you know, after uh, two years of Zoom conferences, you would assume we know how to deal with different time zones. Um, I thought I was actually early here, but my co-author called me that I need to join it and uh, I, I messed up the time. I, I apologize for this, it was not on purpose. Um, and thanks for your patience in staying longer. Um, but let me come back to the discussion. These are really nice comments. Uh, they are more on the methodological side. And I agree, it's certainly helpful to, um, to have uh, more comparisons, I mean, on the theoretical level, uh, and also including some of these comparisons um, for the implementations, like the ill-postness uh, at the boundary, uh, the ill-postness of some estimators or boundary regions. Um, I think it's interesting to connect it to the time series literature on FEM. A couple of points that I just want to make is if we set up a problem, um, in our case, minimizing pricing errors subject to, let's say, second uh, derivative smoothness, what we provide is actually the solution to this optimization problem. Any other solution that imposes more structure, and one could be the splines to assume that the basis functions need to be splines of a certain order. Um, that will be a less optimal solution. I mean, um, by could, we, we don't impose any unnecessary structure to the problem. That's my point here. And the moment you make choices, you at least will get a suboptimal solution to the problem in sample. We can always discuss out of sample if it might help or not, but those are usually ad hoc assumptions. And it also comes with more tuning parameters. If you think about splines, as you mentioned, you need to make choices of what is the order of the splines, et cetera. Um, now, there are some more theoretical points here. Um, when you include regression splines, um, I'm not sure, and I would need to think very carefully about it, but I'm not sure um, if uh, these regression splines would be de defined on the infinite um, real line. So th th there might be certain technicalities that um, need to be taken into consideration. I, I think the bigger picture view that I take here is, um, and that brings in the machine learning. Uh, it's not just the regularization, it's you have a non-parametric problem, but you don't need to take a stand on what the basis function should be. You don't have a lot of choices to make. You take a different perspective by setting up the fundamental nature of the problem and the solution just comes out of that. I think that makes it different from some of these other uh, approaches that were mentioned. And I personally think it's a benefit of what we have. 